the 8th of December, the bottom fell out of our world that day. It would have started for me in late November when I went for my 20-week scan. I discovered that both my babies had some difficulties. My second child was called Cormac and he had Down syndrome. He didn't stay with us for very long. She is daughter number four. You know, she did exist. She, you know, she, she was alive inside me. She died about a week before I was getting a section. She made it very easy because to know that she would have lived for a minute, two minutes, I was told five minutes, ten minutes, she wasn't going to be rushed to an incubator. That was the hardest thing I've ever heard in my life. You're listening to a programme called The Amulet. My name is Caroline Brennan. The loss of a baby is a pain unimaginable. A life that could have been, a very small life that is no more. So how do we Irish mourn the death of a child and most importantly, arrive at a place where we can celebrate with joy his or her short little presence in our world? We, we all encounter loss, all the time. And some aspects of it are far more profound than others, I suppose. In the Amla, it's, it's very profound. That is the voice of Mary Brett, who is a visual artist. And she is the person who is responsible for the collaborative artistic project that is the amulet. It's a really funny word, isn't it? For me, it can be any kind of object. It's like a universal term. It could be bought, it could be given to someone, or it could be made. So it could be made by yourself, it could be made by someone else and given. Or it could kind of find you. You could kind of find it somewhere. Um, I think the most important thing is that it's imbued or charged with some kind of positive intent. So within the object, it holds this kind of fantastic energy that's, that's silent. But it's almost like, you know, if you go into someone's house and you see things on their mantelpiece and you don't know anything about the things that are on the mantelpiece, but one or two of them might really jump out at you and you think, wow that about what's what's that about and it holds a charge and you can feel it it's if it's a positive charge and I think an amulet holds that so that's my understanding so when 10 different Irish women agreed to share with Marie firstly their story of loss and secondly the amulet they decided best represented their lost baby it indicates huge trust deep, deep respect and a mutual honouring of grief through the expression of art. I'm on my way down to West Cork to meet the first of the women who agreed to take part in Marie Brett's amulet project. So here's Mary's story. Do you want to tell me about your little baby? We, we called him Brian after my husband's called Brian. I suppose we found out back in the 8th of December the baby had a condition known as Edward Syndrome. They said their lifespan is very, very short and it would be very short. Like some pe- some kids might live, babies might live a few mo- a month or two, but it would be all hospital care. It's the worst. That news was the worst. And you were just completely numb. And you just couldn't take it in that this was, this was, what was going to happen? And your their fate was decided really already. You want to keep asking the nurse, is there still a heartbeat? Is there still a heartbeat? I suppose that kept me going to make sure that there was a heartbeat, that he was still alive. Like the, the doctor had said that it is very possible that because of the pressure of the labour that you could lose him in that. And he said, he's almost there and... And you kind of, I suppose, that did kind of keep me going. Coming on the end, I really, I could feel myself going downhill very fast. And you do lose the the drive to keep going. You worry that the heartbeat, that you lose him in that last few minutes. But we didn't, you know, he was there for an hour. But just after he was born, I was just thrown. I'd lost all energy, you know. I barely had, I did barely have the strength to hold him. Brian held him for most of it. I, I just, I was totally deflated. I just, I hadn't the energy to hold them until I suppose it was about a half an hour after it, I was kind of pulled myself together and I did, I did have him, but, but Brian had, my husband Brian now has him 
all the time. Yeah, he wasn't taken away at all. You know, the doctor just said, he said, hold him. He said, it won't be long. You feel like he was just lying there and didn't open his eyes. Nothing. You feel like putting a stick in your fingers and opening his eyes and shaking, giving him a good rattle. Just wake up for two minutes, kind of. But if you got that, you'll want more. There'll be something else you'll always want and want and want more for them. Yeah, one minute is more precious than the next. He was just lying very still all the time. But when the doctor came back, it was about an hour later, he said he is, he because he was still kind of quite warm, so he must have only just gone. But I suppose he was still there in our eyes right up till the doctor said, no, there was no more, yeah. You felt like you had the power to keep him going forever and it wasn't there. It wasn't there, no, that was... I couldn't cry, I don't think. I don't think I could even cry because I was... I don't know, I just wanted him there forever. Like when the doctor said it, it was like another another blow to you, yeah. The women who took part in the project came from Cork, from Kerry, from Limerick, from Waterford and from Sligo. Theirs is a very special collaboration with Marie Brett, which will eventually lead to the personal becoming very public in early 2013, when their amulets and their stories will be exhibited. However, Ever before this cohort of mothers came to share their loss, the Amulet Project was weaving its own way through its very own life cycle, which began some time ago. Here's Aidan Warner, who is the principal community worker with the HSE for Cork South. I suppose it started in 2005 when Cork was European captive culture and we uh, got some funding to develop an arts and health strand. We were involved in a uh, a number of programmes using various art forms across different care programmes with the general purpose to explore ways in which we can enhance individual and community health and wellbeing. At a very basic level it allows people who maybe not always have would have been involved with the uh, the arts a chance to participate. My name is Orla Maloney and I'm Head of Arts Participation with the Arts Council. When people think of the Arts Council, maybe they think very quickly of theatres and art galleries. And the area of arts participation is a whole different take on the arts and where they happen and who takes part in the arts. So the arts can take place in hospitals, they can take place in community centres, they can take place on the street, they can take place in really anywhere that people gather. And we're really interested in arts participation, in looking at ways of supporting professional artists to get together with groups and look at what happens. And the exciting part of that is the artist, of course, brings their particular expertise, whether that's in dance or visual arts. But the group of people, they bring all of their own specific experiences, all of their own areas of expertise to bear. And then when you put all of that together, something very exciting happens. And exciting it is. The Amulet, like most collaborative projects, began as something quite different to where it's found itself, as Julie Murphy from the HSE's Cork South area explains. My impression is that it's a very powerful project that's quite complex and that involves a lot of behind-the-scenes work in order to, to accomplish what it's set out to do. So let's consider all that behind-the-scenes work that Julie just mentioned there. By the time the Amulet Project is displayed for the public, it will have gone through a number of stages in its life cycle. The first stage was the research phase. And here's Bernice Jones from the Ballyfahan and Toker Arts and Crafts Initiative. When it first began, it would be because I would have been part of the Battlefield Hand Group that would have worked with Marie Brett on the Four Leaf Clover project. That was just finished and it was on exhibition in the library and we attended an arts and health workshop and it was at that meeting that one of the other women were paired off with Edel Nolan, the arts coordinator in the COH. Nancy had been telling her about the art project that we had just finished with Marie and she seemed to be very interested in it and thought it would be nice to put on exhibition in the COH, which it did, I think, January of the next year. That's how we met Adele, both Nancy and myself and Marie. 
and we sat down and we had conversations around doing an art project for the CUMH. It was Marie's idea about the amulet project, about making amulets for the babies. And we started with the, the research project. That would be about four years ago. The research project was to take two years in total and took many twists and turns along the way. But then, that is what collaboration is all about. Testing, respecting, reflecting and trusting the process. And sometimes, like with the Amulet Project, having to abandon the original idea and go with what is emerging. When we were invited into the maternity hospital to explore the, the viability of doing an art project, we put a frame on it of exploring the idea of an amulet and we didn't really know what might happen there. We kind of felt that it might be people wanted to make amulets as almost um, good luck tokens um, and give them to their family members. Um, it might be that staff would get involved, it might be patients, it might be visitors. The, the staff were feeling that possibly some um, women might be in hospital for a prolonged period of time and be have something nice to do um, that kept them kind of, I suppose, thinking positively while they, they spent their time in hospital. So we kind of did a series of workshops. More importantly, though, I think we, we spent a lot of time talking to staff and it was at one of those meetings that they declared an interest they had with how the amulet could be positioned within the hospital, which was to in some way mark um, a very poorly baby's um, time in hospital by perhaps making an amulet to go on their incubator or it could be perhaps if the baby then died in hospital whether um, you know over a long or short period the parents might take an amulet home or some staff were saying an amulet could be put in a coffin and it was at that point that I thought this is really interesting what's happening. By the end of this first phase of the amulet a book by the same name was published. This book featured the ideas and suggestions of all the organisations already mentioned, as well as from a number of writers, poets and academics. In all, there were 10 different recommendations in how to proceed with the project to the next phase. But needless to say, only one could be adopted. Now it's going to be an individual photographic piece that somehow combines an audio piece with it that is between the artists and the family members and the other partners. We found out we were expecting um, identical twin girls. I got to 32 weeks and we went in for a scan. So we went to the first twin, you know, size, everything was good. And then we went to the second little twin and I remember the consultant looking at me and he said to me, Maria, he said, how has your movement been? And being a midwife myself, I've heard this question before. I knew there was something wrong then at that stage, but still hoping. And I said it was fine because they actually had been quite lively and active that morning. And this was only, say, late morning. But I knew at that stage, I knew that there was something gone, that they hadn't found, you know, a heartbeat. And I remember thinking, that was it. Do you know, for me, my expectations, my hopes, to go from suddenly expecting twins to hear that one's gone is you know it's traumatic so at that stage I remember um, sitting down in front of the consultant and I just remember saying to him at this stage if I was his wife what would he do I remember the consultant looking at me and he just saying that Marie if you're my wife he said I'd you know give this five and twin you know give her a chance but I remember a midwife bringing me into a room and putting the fetal monitor on me to hear the baby's heartbeat and you know looking back I suppose I don't know if it was the selfishness of not going to get what I started out with. I remember I didn't even want to hear the heartbeat because I felt that, you know, I always felt I, I was in it for the two of them, you know. So I remember my son, um, I left the choice up to him, give the two girls their names, and the, the live baby was Leah, and the little dead baby, um, she was Holly. And I remember going into my own house, and I had everything ready for these twins. And I remember that was the thing that killed me, to see the double buggy. And I remember seeing everything in, do you know, two of everything. And I remember that broke my heart. I, I think everyone could hear, you know, the upset upstairs. And Holly was getting buried on the Sunday. And I remember it was the hardest thing for me, you know, leaving the hospital just with my suitcase, you know, leaving one behind. 
going, you know, to bury the other one. And um, I have to say, when I got to the church, my husband's family and my family just there on both sides. You know, we were just having a little blessing. And then she, um, we went up to the grave. And a big thing for me was I could see no clay. You know, I remember it's just beautiful. Both families had done um, flowers the whole way around the inside of the, the grave, which, you know, to this day, after 10 years later, not to see the coldness. Because, you know, babies, they're precious. They're small little bundles. They need to be loved and hugged and, you know, warm. And not to see her going down in a cold grave. And a simple thing, I remember my husband's two brothers, and I remember one of them getting down in the grave and... Um, his other brother handed him the baby. It was like as if they were handling, you know, a little baby, you know, wrapped up in his little blankets, you know, just passing it from one to the other, you know. Out of it all, that's one of the biggest memories I have. I wasn't sure if people would want to be part of it. I, and when I went to the three hospitals and, and sort of, you know, nervously was saying what my interests were. I didn't know if they'd be interested and I didn't know if they'd feel it was appropriate. And and then when they were really interested, I didn't know if they'd be able to locate any bereaved families that would be interested. And what really excited me was the people that did come forward were so enthusiastic about being part of it. There was no hesitancy whatsoever. My name is Anne-Marie Verling and I work as a clinical midwife specialist in bereavement and loss in the Cork University Maternity Hospital. Anne-Marie was the person responsible for sourcing the women from Cork for the project. I met up with her in the Cork University Maternity Hospital to talk about her very special job that put her in contact with the women in the first place. I work as part of a team um, and I have a colleague, Orla O'Connell, who works with me, so we job share in our role, if you like. And I suppose our aim, or our goal, or our job here is to support women who experience pregnancy loss. And that can vary from miscarriage to later pregnancy losses to, to stillbirth or to neonatal deaths. We fill the gap between the medical and um, the personal stories. Um, and I suppose I'm a, I consider myself a patient advocate. When I've spoken to, to different women and they talk about how important small things are, those small things, can we just talk about a couple of those small things that matter? For most women, it's validating their baby and having their baby acknowledged as any baby would be. So for them, I suppose in my job, it's trying to encourage them to, to take that step to recognise and to do all the things they would do um, with any baby they would have so that I suppose they look back and have no regrets. So taking photographs, seeing and holding their baby, creating memories really and the memories they create are to help them and support them in the future and I suppose support them in their grief and to have their baby remembered always in their lives. When I began making this documentary I kept hearing the word Liette and that the Ballyfahan and Toker Community Arts and Crafts Initiative had been making liettes for special babies born in the maternity hospital in Cork since the research and development phase of the Amul project in 2009. I now know that a liette is a tiny little gift that is given to a newborn baby and often takes the form of a set containing useful things such as a blanket, a pair of booties, a little hat and sometimes a baby grow. But what must be said, long before the group were making layettes and involved in this project, they were crocheting and knitting amulets for babies born in the Cork Maternity Hospital for years. Often when babies are born within the hospital services and if they're born especially very prematurely or very small, it can be very difficult to buy clothes to dress the, your baby in. So I suppose one of the things that the Bella Fehan project brought was that they were able to hand make um, items of clothing that were very small in size and donate them to us. And I suppose parents, they appreciate the fact that their baby has an item, be it a blanket, be it some outfits, be it clothes, that make their baby look as normal and as natural and as valued and as important as any baby is um, and so they're wonderful they're wonderful items to have and it's great to be able to dress a baby to do that you know and to hand their the baby to parents knowing that it just makes their baby look special which of course their baby is very special you know 
It's a Monday morning, it's pretty early, and I'm making my way to the Ballyfahan Resource Centre in Cork City. And I'm about to meet a lady called Bridie Casey, who runs a knitting group there, which is part and parcel of the Ballyfahan and Toker Community Arts and Crafts Initiative. So, let's see what goes on in here. I think it's start on uh, 175. Yes. And see how it goes. And see how it goes. Don't Huh? Don't rip it out, no. What do I do? Just cut it there and just start yeah, again? Yeah, again instantly. Bridie, um, you're the coordinator here. Um, how long are you doing it? 17 years. Why, why do you do this work? Well, we started off when the CDP started here. We were doing courses here. But a few of us were able to crochet in it. So we decided to do it ourselves on a voluntary basis rather than paying out to get craft people in. I'm doing it 17 years voluntary. But it's never been a chore for me, so that's how it's successful, I think, yeah. And, and I was just talking to a lot of the women here, and a lot of, of what they produce has gone towards the baby unit. Oh, yeah, very popular again this morning. Three or four blankets, booties, hats come in. So you don't even have to ask them now. They just, if they have wool at home, they'll say, yeah, you can do a few bits for the hospital today. So every Monday there's something will come in for the hospital. I'm here on my own, but I'm not really, because anybody can, that can help, help each other around, yeah. And there's no men? No men. But well, we wouldn't turn them away either, we would. I come here every Monday morning, no, and it is an outlet for me. I was always a knitter, but when I came here, I started to crochet. So I have made two cardigans for myself. I made a couple of hats and cardigans for the baby unit, and now the two blankets for the baby unit. And you know when you say the baby unit, what's your sense of what the baby unit is all about? I had one grandchild died there, and I had another grandchild that was in there for six weeks, but she's fine now. She's out there, so I have first hand of the baby unit, you know. They need the small things because when the babies are born at two and a half pound, three pound, there's nothing really to fit them. So when we make the smaller things, at least they have something to put on them. How long are you coming to this group? Oh God, about, I suppose, eight or nine years. So you're one of the more experienced people? Maybe. <laughs> and can I ask you, have you ever made anything for the, for the baby unit above in the hospital? I have made, I have made things, yeah, for baby units, baby blankets and baby hats. And they went to the hospital, they went actually to the, uh, to the ambulance driver, because the babies are born in the ambulance. So I gave them to a woman that handed to an ambulance driver and he was delighted with them. Have you made items for, for the baby units? It's mostly blankets, because they'd be looking for a lot of the blankets. It's lovely when we went out to the region and we saw all the children and everything and they were wrapped up in the little blankets. You know where they're going and you see it, so it's very visual then, so it's lovely. And the nurses were thanking us and like the staff came in, the doctors came in and when they realised we were the ladies that done it, they really said like it makes such a difference for our parents when they see the babies wrapped up in lovely clothes. So it is, it's lovely. And my mum always says when she's doing it for the babies, she says a stitch is a prayer. Every stitch is a prayer. So that's her way of doing it. So I suppose you can see why this arts initiative has been so closely aligned with Marie Brett's amulet project. Bottom line is that they have been making their very own amulets for the hospital for years. When the Amulet Project was still in the planning stages, it was thought that both Marie Brett and two members of the Ballyfahan and Toker group would meet with each of the TED women who were to partake in the project. But this was not to be. Here's Bernice talking to the project evaluator Margaret O'Sullivan as she describes her two hats, that of being part of the crafts group, but also being one of the ten women who shared their amulets and their story. In a way, you come to this project as a participant with a whole other set of experiences as compared to, say, some of the other participants who come to it without any experience of collaboration. So I'm just wondering how it would have affected your anticipation or expectation around what was going to happen when you first met Marie in your own role as a participant. It was actually very different. (laughs) It surprised me. Um, 
coming in, you come in very vulnerable, actually. And even though, like, I'd have a good relationship with Marie because of our contacts, that particular time, you'd come in, I'd be very nervous, um, very vulnerable, um, which is kind of, I don't, I don't know how to describe it, but that you're, you're not coming with the confidence and the backup that you normally have through the relationship that's still there underneath it all because once we started to work it was very familiar but actually the the initial coming in that morning okay to do the work um yeah there was a multitude of butterflies <laughs> which kind of took me by surprise i didn't think i'd feel like that but i did actually and i knew straight off that when marie had been talking about setting up this first stuff that um that both myself and nancy would go and meet the participants and be there as supportive and I knew straight off okay that that wouldn't work because it's such an intimate setting and it, you you share so much intimately that you wouldn't want to share it with anybody else so instinctively I knew okay why that hadn't happened and why the participants wouldn't do wouldn't want to do that Kathy Sutton lost the first of her twins at 23 weeks. Danielle was stillborn and had Edward syndrome. Danielle was, as any mother will say about their own baby, beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Maybe not everyone would agree because she did have Edward syndrome, which would have made her features look slightly different. We held her and kept her with us for the full two days. I was open and invited anyone who would like to come meet her to meet her because I knew their time was short. But it was important to me that when I spoke about her afterwards that they would know who I was speaking of and know her as that little baby and not as something or part of a pregnancy. It was very important to me that she had her identity. Then, despite all efforts, two weeks later, little Freya's heart stopped. I was induced on the 30th of December and at 5 to 10 that night I gave birth to Freya who who would have looked like a beautiful healthy baby had she had a heartbeat that was all that was missing everything else about her was perfect she was quite a big baby a pound and a half she was she looked quite chunky I washed her a little bit and just all the things that any mother would do with their baby I would still have small regrets to this day, With even with Freya's burial. I, I do remember at the final moments just before Freya was buried and I remember wanting to kiss the coffin and I looked around and decided that I couldn't do it. It would be just so upsetting for all the people around and I decided against it. And that's, that is my huge regret and it might sound trivial to other people but it's a huge regret. Every minute and every hour is not only precious It's also literally a countdown to saying goodbye to your baby for the last time. So from a parent's perspective, missing out on that time, even for a short period, is unacceptable. I did find difficult after Freya was born. We spent about the first hour with her and then the midwives wanted to fill out some paperwork and get her ready and said that they would have her over shortly to me. I waited over three hours, which I felt very, very difficult. And I did ask for her a number of times. And I felt that by the time I got her back, that I know that she was still born to everyone. But by the time I got her back, I felt that she had even deteriorated. And that was a loss. That was a further loss to me. My second child was called Cormac and uh, he had Down syndrome and we figured when he was about a month old that he had serious heart problems. He, he was three months old when he died. He came to Crumlin Hospital in Dublin and like a couple of days before he died they said look what everything we're doing is not working and it's it's really you know stressful for him. He was on sedation and was um, Ah, just, you know, really in poor condition. During that time, it was a bit of an emotional roller coaster. You, you hope, and then you're devastated, and you hope again. And yeah, it was a very emotional time and, uh, you know, difficult time, really. We had planned that in the morning 
um, just myself and his dad would be there with him and that the machines would be turned off so he would naturally die in our arms and I mean I felt good about that because I just could see I mean, it was just really cruel to keep him alive you know for, for, for me or you know it was just it was a relief really to let him go and um, when the nurses came in and you know he was in our arms and turned, they turned off the machines um, you could see the readings changing on the they were checking his oxygen levels in his blood um, it was very kind of undramatic to be honest it was very quiet um, you know I wasn't quite sure what to do or you know it was a very strange experience One by one the different participants met with Marie Brett and each of them brought with them their amulets that represented their lost baby So what was that like for them? To meet Marie to discuss the project and more importantly to have their amulets photographed and begin the process of participating in the amulet project. Here's Anne Dorgan from Cork. Well, it was actually a phone call from Marie Verling in the COMH. So she phoned me to say that this girl by the name of Marie Brett was an artist was doing this amulet, which I didn't even understand what the word meant actually, but uh, she explained then that it was like photographing keepsakes and little things that I had from when I lost my own daughter Eve. Um, she was still born and I don't know I just felt it was something I wanted to get involved and I just felt it was probably the right time she's she's gone now a year and a half ago but I just I just felt yeah I'd like to do that met for coffee which lasted about probably two and a half hours I, I literally just told her my story she was a lovely person and I, I felt comfortable talking about Eve to her she actually started asking me about my keepsakes I have of Eve and of course, when you go home, then you look in your box, you've got loads of them, you know. She told me to bring whatever I wanted to bring. And I went home and I took out my boxes and brought what was important to me. Or, of course, you could have brought them all anyway, because there's just so many memories. And and then I met Marie again in the library here in Cork. And that's where Marie started photographing what I had brought. I'm Pat McCarthy. I'm coordinator of the Cush Came Counselling Programme, which is part of the Social and Health Education Project, in, and we're based in Ballincollig in Cork. Can I ask what your role is in the Amulet Project? My role is, is with uh, my colleague Mary. We are jointly on the committee. When we were asked to do this, um, would we become involved? It was very inviting. It just seemed to fit in with the kind of work that we do. My, I had a personal interest in that I too had lost a baby. So it was um, it was doubly, uh, it's like as if the whole thing has come full circle for me. Oh, it's, it's been great. It's been a pleasure to be part of it. And also we could also um, provide support to the other team members in relation to giving, giving people a reflective space just to talk about the experience and what's happening for them in the process. So you decided to do something with your milk, with your breast milk. When he had died in Crumlin Hospital, before I left, I thought, oh, I must just take the milk that's stored in the freezer and just bring it home. I kept it and I thought someday I will do something with it. Someday soon I'll, I don't know, I wanted to do some sort of ceremony or something. Um, I actually kept it for more than 10 years just kept it kind of hidden in the freezer. I heard about the Amulet Project um, through Mary Brett. You know, I was really kind of saying I'd love to be involved in this. I wanted to do something and I just loved Mary's respectful approach and I thought she'll she'll be my witness. She'll she'll let, she'll just be kind of a connection and I'll I'll you know just simply to photograph the bags of breast milk that's all she wanted to do and that was enough like for me it was just the pressure was off I didn't have to make something 
perf- you know, perfect and beautiful. It was enough for me to just give it, give it to Marie, and it was great. Really, really lovely to be part of it. To me, what's most valuable about the amulet is that it honours and it recognises the experience of women who have been ignored, who've been neglected, um, whose voice has been completely silenced within our society. Lots of women have had that experience in Irish society um, for, for, you know, for lots of different things that have happened to them. But this project, I think, has, has created a space that's safe, where women can have trust that they will be listened to without judgment and where their experience will be will just be honoured. When we were actually doing the recordings and the, the photography, those sessions, they were so intimate. It's kind of you open the door and you share and then you close the door and you walk away. And we haven't really spoken about that, OK? which is kind of a bit surreal that you've been that intimate and then it's like it's never happened. So that feels a little odd. Not that I want to change that, but it, that's just how it feels. I met with Marie Brett a number of times throughout the making of this project at various venues and locations around Cork City. However, in order to see her at work, I had to travel many miles to her own home place. So you got here okay, Caroline? You're very welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Dear God, I mean, you live in isolation. Yeah, it's lovely up here, up in the hills. We're at the end of the valley, right. so it's kind of like a hidden valley in a way. <laughs> so will we go and have a look and see where all the magic happens? I'm coming into the studio. Watch your step there, uh-huh. mate. Okay. This is my kind of workspace, my cabin, so come on in. Oh, it's, it's, it's actually lovely and warm in here because yeah. it's freezing outside. It's nice and snug, yeah. yeah. So where on the project phase was Marie now? I've now worked with participants. So I've worked with 10 individuals, um, 10 family members. That work's done. I've made recordings and done photographs. I'm now going to spend a period of time working with that material. So I suppose that's the sort of second third that's ahead of me that I'm just looking at starting sort of soonish. And then there'll be the stage when it goes out into the world and it's exhibited and the the kind of dissemination that surrounds that. So that'll be kind of the third stage in my thinking. Now, when I spoke with um, all the women, uh, I know that some were very clear and brought one amulet that represented their baby. And then there were other ladies who brought many, many things. Now, I know that you photographed all of what they brought. How in God's name do you decide which image that you actually use and take right through to the end. It's really difficult I suppose because I know the end artwork's going to be a visual image Mm. and a sound piece combined I kind of had to continuously look at the image for how it worked as an image but also in the back of my mind be thinking what part of the audio is going to be connected with this image so when I first started I began to look at the images for their own sake and the reading I could get from them. And that's kind of natural. So I'd have a a pool of selection just based on how does this image work? Is it a success visually or not? And then when I was listening to the audio, making selections from that, I was thinking, well, how now does this work with what's been said? Is Is it kind of simply descriptive or can a, an interesting tension be put between the image and the audio? So so my challenge is always looking at the two together. But at the end, I know that when someone comes and sees the work, they'll see the image first and then they will be invited to listen to the audio. That's kind of naturally how people will interact with the work. So I know the image has to be a success on, on kind of classical fronts. So it's a, it's a challenge. It's a kind of a balance between the two in a way. I knew that in the next few months before I would meet Marie Brett again for the exhibition, that she'd be mad busy. Her work was multifaceted, but she would spend so much time creating those tensions, those stories, those art pieces. 
to the standard and the level that she felt would be fitting the celebration of lost lives. It's a heavy burden, representing and celebrating the little lives of Holly, of Cormac, of Freya, of Bernadette, of Brian, of Danielle, of Lucy, of Robbie, of Stuart and Eve. It's early March and I'm at the Sirius Art Centre in Cove and about to meet Marie and see how the installation of the project is going in anticipation of its launch in just two days' time. Marie, you've been mad busy. Yeah, I've been working away. It's the third day now installing the work, so yes, it's been a busy couple of days, definitely. And you're knackered? I am very tired. (laughs) The adrenaline's keeping me going. So for somebody who's going to walk into the exhibition, can you paint a picture of what they see and how you've actually displayed the Amula project? In each gallery, there's an installation of work that consists of five pieces of work, and each of them consists of a, a white table and a white stool, and with a photograph with piercings in a very large frame that's on the table, and an audio piece that's played by a CD player and heard by earphones that are attached. It's very minimal and very sparse in terms of how it's presented. I suppose inviting the viewer to come and immerse themselves in the work by sitting at the table, looking at the visuals and listening to the audio. I mean, the gallery now is quiet. There's just you and me in it. I'm imagining when there's the opening, it'll be a very different space and the work will be kind of standing on its own merit, really. So, yeah, it's exciting. Right, so let's see how it goes. (laughs) Thank you. Hi, I'm Mary. So I've uh, listened to two of the women's stories so far and they're just incredibly moving. I mean, I I I find it even hard to say because they just touch touch very deeply. I I find it hard to say much about them. The one significant thing I found on listening to the ten voices going around today was, was the sadness in the voices, the trembling voice. The one thing we have in common is the big loss. And that loss, no matter what, can never be replaced. We'll move on. Please, God, go on and have other children and that. But the wanting was the trembling of the vices. Uh, for me, to be here for the actual opening has, has been an amazing experience. The way the, the work is presented, sitting at the tables, engaging with, with the objects and listening to the stories just brings you into the actual experience the women have had. So, as I say... It hasn't been a direct experience, but it's been profound at the same time attending here. I just found that other people's stories would have reflected my thoughts. I could almost feel their distress while they spoke and told about their stories and what they had experienced. It's obviously similar for most parents who do lose their babies. Thank you all so much for coming. It's really brilliant to see people here. And you know, it's a kind of scary business when you install a, a kind of a big collection of artwork. And this moment now it's live and it's got to live out in the world. There's a few people that I must thank, um, especially and foremost all the collaborators that work with me, the participants. It was a two-way exchange and I really hope that they're pleased with the work. It's a scary business and a scary time for both of us, you know, in terms of the work now being kind of manifest from that collaboration. And so we have come to the end of the Amulet Project, led by the stories of brave women who refuse to allow the memories of their babies be forgotten. It was also led by one determined artist whose determination was to ensure that that never happened. The project was also supported by statutory organisations who today stand strong in ensuring the acknowledgement of small, brief lives. And for me, I want to dedicate this documentary to all those countless older men and women all around Ireland who many decades ago lost tiny sisters, brothers, 
sons and daughters, and whose tiny lives at the time were never formally acknowledged by the state, nor rarely spoken about by their families or their communities. We have come a long way, thankfully. I'm Caroline Brennan. Thanks for listening. This programme was kindly funded through the Sound and Vision Scheme, which is a funding scheme from the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland.